How do you design an aggregate in domain-driven design? An aggregate is a cluster of related objects often used to maintain the complexity of business rules and maintain data consistency. Now where designing aggregates often goes wrong is really focusing too much and thinking about the hierarchy and the relationship between entities. Hey everybody, it's Derek Colmartin from CodeOpinion.com. I'm going to explore this more and give an example as well as illustrate why thinking differently about commands and queries has a drastic impact on how you think about aggregates and how you design them. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So I generally feel like most aggregates are designed with thinking about relationships. What I mean by that is I have an aggregate here of various entities and value objects. At the very top, I have our aggregate root. This is the entity where our callers are all making our inbound calls to, not directly to any other entities within our aggregate. So the example I'm using was given by a member on my private Discord server. Check the link in the description on how to join. And it's this, let's say we have a route. You can think of this as like a bus route. And there are many different locations on a route. For each different location, there's a single vending machine. Now these vending machines may be emitting event data or telemetry data, like the temperature, as well as maybe when somebody actually purchases something, there's a sale, it's emitting that. So we have a route that has many different locations and each location has a vending machine. So the first thing to notice is all I really talked about is the relationships. Again, an aggregate is a cluster of related objects. So I've defined and given what this relationship is, but I haven't really mentioned at all about like what's the behaviors, what does these things actually need to do? What does the route need to do? What kind of business logic is around that or the locations or the vending machine? All I'm really describing so far is the relationships. So here's some code to illustrate how we would model this if we were really only ever thinking about relationships between entities. So the first thing I'm gonna show is kind of backwards. I'm gonna show the vending machine. So we have this vending machine uh, entity and it has one method on it really called add alarm which you can say, okay, let's say the temperature's down. There's some reason we, we trigger alarms essentially. So we have this add alarm method. We specify what the location is for which vending machine, when the alarm triggered, the date time. And then we have this event that I'm creating called alarm triggered. And let's say when this actually gets persisted, after it gets persisted behind the scenes, we're publishing these maybe to a message broker so we can have other consumers deal with that. So there's our vending machine. And as, as I mentioned, a vending machine is associated to a location. So here's our location, has an ID, maybe some name, some a lot long, some coordinates, and then we can associate our vending machine to it. Now, again, we're not calling these directly, rather we're calling via our aggregate route, which is our route. So our route may have a name. Um, we can add a location. We can, here we can add a new location. We can, add a vending machine to a location, and we can trigger that alarm on a vending machine. So these are all kind of different simple behaviors that I had, really just dealing with the, the kind of the relationships. The only one that's really kind of out of the blue here is this alarm to kind of trigger that alarm. And what I have here at the very top is in our aggregate route, this route, I have the ability to expose the alarm count, like the number of times an alarm has been triggered and what the last alarm date time was. So all the code really is, is this, we have our aggregate route, which is our route, and it's exposing a way to add new locations. And then it can also add a vending machine to a location. And the only real behavior we have is being able to kind of trigger that alarm for a vending machine. But we don't really have any business logic. All our real code defining this is kind of a way to build up a hierarchy of kind of this object model. Really, we just are exposing a way to build up kind of this data model hierarchy. That's really it. Now, while this is a simple example, the point I'm trying to get across here is that we're modeling the relationships. That's really the only business rules that we're kind of enforcing is defining these relationships, the one-to-one -one and the one-to-many. We don't really have any business logic. Yes, we would have things like being able to change a location's route, like getting it onto a different route, different data properties on any of these entities and being able to change those, sure. But really all we're using this for is defining relationships. Now, depending on what type of database you're using, you can enforce these relationships with constraints at your database level. 
You can also just be thinking about transaction scripts and data models. Again, you don't necessarily need to be creating this hierarchy and these methods to create this hierarchy. It can just be data models against your database using transaction scripts. You wanna be using aggregates, which again are these cluster of related objects, but related how? Related to the invariance, the business rules that you need to apply, things that always must be true. Then you can save that entire cluster together, again, why it's a consistency boundary. So you wanna be using them to enforce invariance beyond just those relationships. So why would you be enforcing invariance? When do you need to do that? You only need to enforce invariance when you're actually making state changes. So if we look back at this code, I had two properties for exposing the alarm count, the number of times the alarms have been triggered, and then the last time it's been triggered, the date time. But if we're thinking about state changes and using aggregates for state changes, then why do we need to expose this data? This leads us to CQRS. This means when our client needs to make some type of state change, it can perform a command that uses our aggregate to imply those invariants and then make the state change to our database and save the persist, that entire aggregate, that cluster as one. Then from there, let's say as the example, we needed to get the number of alarms that were triggered. We can do that on our query side, not using the aggregate. And this could be a materialized view. It could be the exact same underlying data source but a means to actually get that data more optimized for the query side, rather than having to fetch that entire aggregate and get all that data back. So if we stop thinking purely about relationships and thinking about, okay, what's the actual behaviors? What consistency we, do we need within that cluster, within that aggregate? Well, our vending machine is really the one doing all the work. It has the alarm as the example. So instead, if we separate it, it when we call the alarm, we add a triggered alarm from our vending machine, we could be publishing a domain event and we could have a separate aggregate consume that if it actually need to know about that alarm being triggered. Or again, as I mentioned, more likely what it cares about is on a query purpose, separately, it could be persisting that in some meaningful way for, like I said, a materialized view, some way that's more optimized for queries. But if you did need it for a command purpose in our aggregate that's on our route with locations, we could just be publishing a domain event and consuming that in our other aggregate. It's typical to design aggregates and thinking of them purely based on hierarchy, how the relationships between these value objects and entities apply and what the root is. That's really typical, but what we need to be doing is thinking about how we apply various invariants, the rules that always need to be true, and then behind that, what's the data that drives those invariants? That's the, what we actually want to care about. That's actually what is related between different entities within our cluster, our aggregate. Putting objects together that are related together in an aggregate, not by relationship, but how we apply the business rules, those invariants, and the data behind it. If you think about commands and queries separately, you're only thinking about your aggregates for writes. That means that the data that you care about is applicable only for making state changes. This can simplify your life a lot in thinking separately for queries and how you wanna optimize for that. And it really then narrows what your aggregates do. They will become smaller. They'll become limited in scope because you're thinking purely about state change and implying invariance, less about relationships between entities and some type of hierarchy. If you like this topic and you have some questions, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server where you can chat with other software developers about topics like this and software architecture and design. Check the links in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.